Yeah, so this project was actually carried out with, uh, with Hiroya Benko um, at last summer at Microsoft Research, and thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, field of view. So this is a diagram of the binocular field of view of the human visual system. Uh, this is from Jones's Illuminum paper. Um, and you can see in the middle, combining the green, yellow, and orange areas, that's the, uh, the foveal area, the part that senses detail and color. And on the outside, the red and blue areas, that's the peripheral vision. That's the part that gives you context, motion, and notification. The peripheral vision uh, serves very different functions from the foveal area um, and has a lot less spatial resolution. Now, the total field of area is around 190 degrees horizontal. And when we're out and about in physical reality, uh, the peripheral vision is constantly stimulated by the world around us, providing us with excellent spatial awareness and motion detection. But by contrast, modern virtual reality systems with horizontal fields of view of around 90 to 110 degrees are like looking into binoculars. You can see that even a 100 degrees horizontal field of view, denoted by this purple box here, uh, dis discards huge swaths of our, virtual, of our visual field. Although users might feel as if they're immersed in the, in the virtual environment, they're really getting a kind of tunnel vision. Uh, the areas outside the VR display space are just black. This reduces spatial awareness and can impact immersiveness. In current generation augmented reality systems, the situation is even worse. The field of view is even narrower, down to 40 degrees horizontal. Just that little tiny purple area in the middle. And indeed, 40 degrees is actually the upper end for current commercial AR devices. So naturally, of course, wider fields of view have been long sought after in the literature. But there's three primary obstacles which have prevented widespread adoption. First of all, wide fields of view demand specialized optical setups to extend the display into the peripheral regions and wrap the display around the user's head. Existing approaches go, to go beyond 100 degrees include things like tiling displays, complex freeform optical des uh, designs like the catadioptrical optical setup used by Nagahara et al. on the left, carefully designed Fresnel lenses like those used in the HTC Vive and this Star VR prototype in the middle, or novel light field displays like Maimone's pin, pin light displays. Secondly, wide fields of view demand a lot of computer power to actually render. A high resolution full field of view image can be three times as many pixels as a standard field of view. If you combine this with the very high refresh rates that are required for flicker-free visuals, um, this results in a significant computational cost. Finally, human physiology presents the third major barrier. You've all heard about um, motion sickness from the previous talk. And um, we talked about the, virgin, the virgin's accommodation conflict. But the other major conflict is um, this, the, the sort of motion sickness uh, conflict. Your body gets its, self, its sense of self-motion from two different sources. The visual information, which is basically optical flow across the periphery, and a vestibular information, consisting of physical motion that's sensed by the inner ear. And in VR, those don't always coincide. When you're moving your head around in VR, you know, your head's moving, so you get vestibular information, and the visuals will update at the same time, so there's no conflict. But if you move yourself around, like with a joystick, um, only the visual periphery will actually see that motion. And the result is what we call vection. That's uh, an illusion of self-motion that has no corresponding vestibular input. High levels of vection can lead to motion sickness. And if you extend the periphery, that only makes that worse. So our solution to these problems is the sparse peripheral display. It's a field of view extension that consists of a sparse array of LED lights positioned in the, virtu in, in the visual periphery. We developed two different prototype devices. The first prototype, dubbed Sparse Light VR, was based on this Oculus uh, Rift DK2 virtual reality headset, to which we added 70 LEDs to form the sparse peripheral display. On top of that, we covered the LED LEDs with a translucent Delrin plastic diffuser to soften and distribute the light. And here's what that looks like in action. In this prototype, the rendering is all driven from an external computer, and tracking is provided by an external tracking camera. And here's what the field of view of the Oculus VR looks like, that purple box in the middle. And here's what that visual field looks like when augmented with our sparse light VR LEDs. Note that the sparse peripheral LEDs cover a 170 degrees horizontal field of view. 
Our second prototype, which we call SparseLite AR, was built on top of a custom AR device from Microsoft Research, featuring a 62-degree horizontal field of view. This AR device is a, mo is a modified Galaxy Gear um, driven by a standard Galaxy S6 smartphone mounted on top, as you can see. And the display is routed through a, a pair of curved collimating mirrors at the bottom, which reflect the light into a pair of, uh, of half-servered mirrors to create the illusion of uh, images floating in midair. Now, on the left side is our IMU unit that comprises an accelerometer and gyroscope and the tiny little Arduino tucked away at the very left side, which drives a sparse periphery LED array. And to this design, we added 112 LEDs to form the sparse periphery and covered them with a paper diffuser. And we use paper here instead of uh, plastic to reduce weight and bulk. And here's what that all looks like when combined together. Here's a simple AR scene. Um, this prototype is fully self-contained. The display and LEDs are all driven off of the smartphone itself, which renders everything in real time. You can see that uh, basically here, you know, you have the butterflies that end up sort of in red, or uh, in blue rather, and the bouncing ball that ends up in red. And uh, here's the field of view of our AR device with the LEDs to show that we have about 190 degrees horizontal field of view. So sparse peripheral displays, as you can see, are inexpensive, very simple to manufacture, and can be retrofitted into existing VR and AR displays. They provide a very wide field of view without running into the same problems as traditional approaches. Because of the low spatial resolution of our peripheral uh, vision, they don't require quite so many complex optics to focus on the sparse periphery. And rendering these LEDs is also a lot simpler and can be done at very high frame rates. And finally, as we'll show in our user study, sparse peripheral displays can be designed to reduce motion sickness, even when compared with conventional, non-wide field of view displays. So now I'll explain how this all works. We implemented everything using the Unity game engine, using the Oculus VR library. We, augment, we augmented the default Oculus camera rig with a set of light probes. Those correspond to the physical positions of the LEDs relative to the eyes. Uh, here you can see all the light probes we used for the sparse light VR prototype. Note that there are two sets of light probes, one for each eye. And here it looks like they're actually overlapping um, just because of the rendering and because of the scaling from the camera. But actually, in practice, they're viewed by separate eyes, so there's no overlap. Um, for each eye, we added a, a virtual periphery camera that has a very wide field of view but low output resolution. We average the colors of each frame according to a pre-computed distance-limited Voronoi diagram. Each LED is then set to the average color of, uh, in the CIE LAB color space. And we use that because it averages the colors much nicer than, a, than the other color spaces. And the results you can see are shown on the right. Uh, we then convert those colors from the graphics card's sRGB color space into the linear RGB color space used by the uh, LEDs and apply a per-channel calibration that matches the uh, peripheral LEDs with the main display's color and brightness. Finally, we send those resulting colors to the Arduino uh, using a serial connection, which then communicates with the LEDs to actually set their colors. The LEDs themselves are actually wired in series using a daisy-chained serial protocol to re reduce the number of control wires down to one, so we don't need a giant mess of wires to control all 100 LEDs. Both of our prototypes update those LED strips at over 75 frames per second, which matches the update rate of the main display. So with the sparse periphery, we can render content independently of the main display. So consequently, we came up with three different visualizations that can be applied to our sparse periphery. First, a designer can choose to simply render the full environment to the periphery. That's uh, useful for simply providing extra context to the user, treating this as basically an extension of the main display. Second, the sparse periphery can be used to only render particular objects of interest in the manner of a heads-up display. So here in one of our study tasks, we render a particular target, that's here a white target, into the periphery. Finally, we developed a visualization technique which we call the countervection visualization. When the camera moves through color, uh, controller input or scripted events, we display a pattern that moves in the same direction as the movement, or in other words, actually in the opposite direction as the environment. This actually helps to reduce the apparent motion perceived by the peripheral vision. Our goal with this visualization was to reduce motion sickness by reducing vection. Now, the sparse periphery on its own already increases ve vection if you render it using the traditional environment mode, uh, since it fills your peripheral vision with you know, moving targets. And we 
Initially, we thought to actually uh, create a visualization to enhance that vection effect. Um, so, you know, we, we actually created a visualization where those bars move in the, in the opposite direction as the motion, so in the same direction as the environment. Um, in, in this diagram, you can see how that works sort of diagrammatically. Um, if the user is moving uh, backwards, for example, then all the, all the actual uh, visual motion will actually be in the forwards direction in all of the zones. It, this seems natural, actually. It, it, we wanted to enhance the user's Im immersion by enhancing the sense of motion. But it turns out that this is really, really nauseating. Um, we couldn't even stand it, so we couldn't let our participants you know, try this condition. Uh, so surprisingly, actually reversing the flow of motion to produce countervection significantly reduced uh, feelings of nausea in pilot testing, even when compared with having no peripheral stimulation at all. Here we show diagrammatically how that works. Um, if the direction, if the people are moving, if you're moving backwards in the visual scene, then actually the periphery will move uh, backwards and the, only the environment will move forwards. Um, we hypothesize that the reduction in vection is due to conflicting information between the near periphery in red and the far periphery in blue, but we haven't fully tested this and further research would be needed to actually tease out exactly why this works. So we're not the only ones who tried to, uh, to do some motion sickness reduction through peripheral manipulation. Uh, Fernandez and Feiner developed a technique which shrinks the field of view gradually during motion, and that works pretty well. We're taking a different approach to try to maintain the full field of view. Our countervection visualization is implemented just as a series of blue and green stripes. This is a bit of a confusing video, to be honest, um, which are rendered on a pair of spheres only visible to the peripheral cameras. The textures on the spheres are dynamically adjusted to achieve the desired effect. Now, uh, we don't render the countervection visualization if the user is only moving their head, because head motion doesn't generate vection. Only extrinsic motion does. Here again, you can see the countervection visualization in action. If the user is moving forward, you can see basically the stripes are rendered moving forwards as well. If the user turns, the stripes are rendered rotating in the same direction as the motion. And if the user stands still, basically the regular uh, field of view is rendered. The regular environment is rendered. So we ran a user study to quantify the effects of sparse periphery on user performance and comfort within VR. Our first study aimed to quantify the spatial awareness afforded by the expanded periphery. Users were asked to perform a very simple search task, uh, trying to locate the, the, a white target from among a, a grid of green circles. We ran this under three different conditions. A narrow 50 degree field of view that simulates typical augmented reality environments. A regular field of view that uses the Oculus VR's entire range. And a wide field of view condition where the target was rendered on the sparse periphery. Each trial consisted of selecting a single target, starting from the position of the previous target. And because those were played, placed randomly, sometimes in the field of view and sometimes not in the field of view, um, we did not measure average trial completion time because it was, too, uh, it, was too, it was too varied. Instead, we measured task performance by the average targeting velocity. That's basically dividing the distance to the next target by the actual completion time in the trial. Here, higher velocities are better. And we further subdivided by whether the target was initially visible in the field of view or not. And we found that in all cases, the sparse periphery provided a significant improvement in targeting velocity, allowing users to find and hit the target they wanted faster. We also measured movement ratio, which compares how much the user moved their head compared with a theoretically optimal path. So here, lower ratios are actually better. This metric measures basically the search overhead, uh, how much the user had to actually hunt around to actually find the target of interest. Um, for both initially visible and initially invisible targets, the uh, augmented reality condition was significantly worse than the other two. In our second study, uh, we sought to actually measure the sparse peripheries effect on simulator sickness. This study consisted of two different tasks. In this first task, um, users chased a little orb as it moved around a fixed path through this forest scene, using a gamepad controller to move themselves around. We compared three different conditions here, VR alone, so the, only the VR field of view, VR with the periphery rendering a normal content, and VR with the periphery rendering our countervection visualization. Users performed the first task three times, once per condition, in random order. And then in the second task, users were allowed to move themselves freely using the gamepad, and were allowed to also freely switch between any of our three different conditions. And they were asked to basically stay in that virtual environment and move themselves around until they could fully force rank, force rank the conditions in order of comfort. In total, 14 of our participants completed both of the tasks. In the second task, nine of the participants force ranked countervection first. Two of the participants ranked the ordinary periphery condition first, and three participants chose the standard no periphery condition. 
In total, it demonstrates that participants generally preferred the sparse periphery conditions and most preferred the countervection mode. So we feel that our work has actually opened up a number of avenues for future exploration. Uh, we'd like to further explore the application space for sparse peripheral displays, for example, using them to provide unobtrusive peripheral notifications. Our countervection visualization provide, provided some very interesting study results, and we'd like to further push on that to expand or to gain more insight into our technique. And uh, find, uh, further research into this technique should help to actually mitigate, further mitigate simulator sickness. Finally, we'd like to investigate whether the sparseness itself actually helps to reduce simulator sickness. Um, preliminary results suggest that that effect actually may exist, but a full comparison study with full resolution periphery would be needed to really evaluate this. Okay. Thank you very much for listening.